The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. This morning's message is facing your fear, facing your fears, plural, facing your fear, the enemy of your soul. Uh, It was brought to my attention this week that everything in the enemy's kingdom is fear-based. And that fear, you might think he's attacking you at work, he's attacking your finances, you might think he's attacking your marriage, he may be attacking, attacking, attacking. But in reality, the bottom line, I like foundations. I like starting with the core area, filling the cracks in the foundation. In reality, he's attacking your identity. I want you to think about that for a minute. Yes, you see warfare on different fronts in your life, but nonetheless, he's attacking your identity. And uh, in, the, in the Gospel of Luke, in the fourth chapter, if you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. You could say the temptation was a lust of the flesh for food after fasting. But in reality, the real test was if you are the son of God. See, that's, that's what he wants to do to each and every one of us. He wants you to fail to recognize who you are because it will interfere with your destiny. And it will, it will to wherever your destiny is incomplete and immature in any way, shape, or form. It's where fear ruled. Fear is the devil's kingdom. Fear is the essence of his very nature. That's what he uses to motivate. That's, what he, that's his character. Uh, that's the basis of sin. It's in the wrong kingdom. When you were born again, you were translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love. And I remember when uh, I saw the potential in this beautiful woman who is my wife, I watched her teach in a, in a small Sunday school class, and I saw a world-class teacher, and yet her mentors uh, basically had a bad theology, I think, even though she was a Bible school president. Um, she had the theology based on experience, and she saw so many damaged people. She was also secular. She was also a school psychologist. Uh, She was a brilliant woman, uh, uh, a wonderful woman in many ways, but her theology was based on, if you're not pretty well adjusted by the time you get saved, you're probably not gonna amount to much. And I I, I feel sorry for that because I, I see that the potential in every single person was the way God made them, not the way society has made them, not the way they've made themselves, and not the way they've taken the advice of other people. But the potential is always the new, the new creation. You are what you are. You are born again of incorruptible seed. Sure, it can be corrupted, but if it's corrupted, it's by the wrong kingdom. And like we used to say, uh, uh, God didn't make anybody dysfunctional. You did that all by yourself. <laughs> Isn't that something? We were able to respond incorrectly to the world, the flesh, and the devil, and basically developed our own dysfunctions. So if you want to recognize the enemy, the enemy to your identity is basically, sure, you can say the lust of the flesh, the temptations of Jesus in Luke chapter 4. You can say it's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. I'll give you all these kingdoms uh, and throw yourself down. Prove to me who you are, uh, the pride of life. But in reality, the attack was on who he was, that he was the son of God. And there's always, always in the kingdom of fear a a desire or a, a, a momentum to push you into doubt, fear, and unbelief. Do you agree with that? So to the degree you agree with that, you diminish your destiny because you diminish who you really are. And so I think we need to, uh, I love the how-tos, and when I say that the fear is the enemy to your soul, I like to break that down and say, well, let's give me some practical ways to combat that then. How can I combat 
the fear to my soul. And when I use the word soul, I know theologians argue over spirit, soul, and body, and I say, let them argue. Uh, For me, my bottom line is God created me a thinking, feeling, choosing being, and everything that we based and saw real, real change and transformation in people's life was that the Holy Spirit needs to be Lord over the thinking, the feeling, and the choosing. So you can break the theology into the dichotomy, trichotomy, you can take whatever kind of otomy you want, but ultimately God says I made you a thinking, feeling, choosing being, and all three should be under the authority of the Holy Spirit. So when I use the word soul, I am using mind, will, and emotions. And if fear is going to attack you, I think it's interesting to see that he's coming against your identity. When uh, Jennifer and I got married, I, I kind of nicknamed her. It wasn't a very positive thing. It was in joking, but nonetheless, she was brilliant with the answers and well-studied, extremely well-studied. Of course, if I could read as fast as her, I could study it too. She turns the pages like this. <laughs> Allison can do that too, right? Your daughter. Allison took a, a, a course once on reading and I forget how many thousands and thousands of words per minute it was, but a young man was in her class and he had just increased like a hundred words or something and he was all proud and he goes, Allison, how many words a minute do you read? And the teacher got in between and said, don't ask, don't ask. I I don't want you to get disappointed. Okay, but at the same time, at the same time with all of this biblical knowledge, I used to nickname her Little Much Afraid. How many ever heard of Little Much Afraid? Hind's feet in high places. Uh, Little Much Afraid, it was, for Jennifer, the sky was always falling. And in less than two months, people taking a 60-day challenge, don't tell me God can't do a fast work, although it's progressive. Fast, but progressive. There's no instant maturity. But in less than 60 days, I saw this woman conquer all of the fears in her life. Fear was a, was, a, was a primary overshadowing of the things that she had gone through in her life. And she'd gone through some difficult um, scenarios in her life. But nonetheless, she became a, a bold, courageous, to this day, I do not see fear in her. 17 years later, and I still do not see fear in Jennifer. If God says it, I do it. It's that simple. And, and there's just no questioning of it. I can't remember the last time I saw her afraid. And it's a testimony that each person has the capacity to enter into their identity, but you must know any, any bad behavior you got is fear-based because that's the enemy's kingdom. That's the way he operates. And he does attack. Uh, he is the enemy of our soul. And it's a question of Jennifer coming into her own It was basically, instead of seeing deficiency, which is what fear does, fear always tries to show you there's not enough of something. You might think he's attacking your finances, your job, your, but I'll tell you what, he's really attacking your identity. He wants to diminish you more than he cares about that other stuff. He wants you to have doubt in and of yourself and not know who you are. He wants to emphasize deficiency when God's trying to emphasize throughout the scriptures. I mean, this is a real understatement. Sufficiency. Is there anything in the scripture that does not point to God as sufficient? More than enough. All right, then that therein lies part of the battle, deficiency and sufficiency. You could even uh, go to prayer and say, where do I feel deficient? Because that's a place where Jesus isn't ruling. Any of your deficiencies, there's something wrong there where fear has found an avenue in to your life and is ruling, and you want the peace of God to rule. You can make all kinds of excuses. Matter of fact, that's what prolongs it. God can't heal an excuse. He can only, he can only, you can only say, here's a deficiency. I want God to be my sufficiency. And therein um, is the beginning of the answer. But I, I want to cover this mind, will, and emotions. I see that when it comes to uh, the mind, Scripture, when it's dealing with the mind, has a reference to light versus darkness. Light versus darkness. When it's dealing with the will, it's basically life versus death. 
When it's dealing with the emotions, it's love in contrast to lust. So if we know that there's, there's, there's some parallels, that when the enemy attacks with fear, when he attacks the mind, it's going to be one way. When he attacks the will, it's going to be another way. When he, when he attacks the emotions, it's going to be another way. So once you, I would write that down, light versus dark over the mind. And you can take all of the scriptures and you basically see the comparison between light and dark. When it talks about the illumination that comes from God and the darkness, which is alienation from God uh, and the futility of your mind walking in darkness. By the way, as far as your identity, you are a child of light. You're to walk in the light and he is the father of light. So right there tells you that darkness would be the enemy for the thinking and for the thought life. The will, it's life versus death. And by the way, you know, the fear in the mind is basically the fear of the unknowable. Always battling, I have to figure it out. I must know. Says who? I found that the greatest pursuit in my Christian life was the railroad track scripture that God gave me as a baby Christian, that I might know him that I found out in my identity to love God and to serve him was the priority. My priority was not knowing. My priority was knowing him. And in knowing him, he's been made unto me wisdom. You want wisdom or the application of how to live life, then basically you need to know him who has been made wisdom rather than seeking answers. The wise have to change in your life if you're really going to grow. If you're really going to grow and win that battle, and not let fear rule your mind. People actually get fearful and frustrated when they don't know something. When in reality, they should be pursuing Him to love and know God. I sought the Lord and He heard me and He delivered me from all my fears. That could be Jennifer's testimony, couldn't it? I sought the Lord and He heard me and He delivered me. Let's, let's just look at the mind, the light versus darkness. Let's look at the battle and understand it. How to overcome the fear of the unknowable. And when I say the unknowable, there's things that he can make known, but there's things that in and of your flesh you will never know. You couldn't have even figured out salvation using your mind had you not an encounter with the living God and received him. Because it's, it's a matter of supernatural uh, enlightenment. Psalm 139 verses 1 through 4 Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. God knows me. I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for welfare, not calamity. So what's that mean? If I want to know something, I go to him. He knows. Why would I try to figure out something that God knows the answer to? Why don't I do like David and make God my vital necessity? Why don't I inquire and require of him instead of floating in a self-confident seat of the pants, so to speak, uh, whatever seems right to me, I'm going to do it. Actually, the book of Judges, that was the primary all-pervasive sin throughout the book of Judges. Each one did what was right in his own eyes. There is a way that seems right, but the end is destruction. So it's not about seeming right, it's about being right. And being right is righteousness, and it's in him. He has been made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification. He, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. People want wisdom and they pray for wisdom, but in reality, the wisdom is found in knowing him to the degree you are intimately acquainted, that I might know him, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of his person, Philippians 3.10 in the Amplified. So God knows me, and one of the things that he showed me as far as light, even in the midst of my darkness, was Hebrews 4.13. And I was uh, raised with uh, uh, word people. How many know what word people are? Faith people, okay? Good thing. And I, I saw such a refreshing positive attitude in their lives over much of what I saw in the church 
with, uh, with some of the other people who are always down and out. I'm a worm. I'm no good. My righteousness is this filthy rags. Then I saw faith people and word people are basically saying, I am the righteousness of God in Christ, and I like me. And I saw that there was a health to the optimism, but I could discern at times, even in the optimism, there was fear fear coming from them while they were saying the right things. So I says, it's got to be more than just saying the right things, because if fear's coming from you, that's the wrong kingdom. And what I saw was that uh, the word, the word, the word, and for me, it's the person, the person, the person, and he, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. I wanted to know him. I wanted a relationship with the living word, not about the word. And so I began to say, in, uh, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword and able to divide asunder. That's what I want to know. I want to discern. I want to differentiate. I want to divide asunder between soul and spirit, joints and marrow. And it says, but then verse 13 hit me, and all things are naked and open to the word. No. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And I saw the precedent being set in my life that the living word was more significant than the written word. Maybe that's not a great revelation to you, but it was to me. Because I found out that I needed, I needed the living word more than I needed the written word, but I needed the written word to reveal the living word. And I began to see that that Psalm 139, 6 at verse 6 says, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. There was another hallmark of a how-to to grow in the knowledge and the wisdom of God. I recognize that there's some things I'll never know. Some people need that. It would take the fear and the, and the struggle out of your Christian life. There are some things you're not going to know until Jesus comes. There are some things in the Bible that are difficult to understand. There are some things that are so simple, you can't miss it. Do the things that are so simple, you can't miss it, and he will add those other complicated things to you. But I see it's more important that the things, that there's things that I will never know. You'd be surprised what that could do to you to enter into a more God confidence and less confidence in, in this thinker up here is to basically relax and yield that there's some things I'll never know. But I know this, that I'm going to pursue knowing him, and in the knowing him, whatever I need to know, he will be sufficient to give it to me at the right time and the right place. But I am not going to live in fear of struggle. That mind, that mind is a terrible thing to waste, and while you're struggling, you're wasting it. It's almost as bad as a mind on drugs. It's, 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 being, it's being seduced by reason, whereas reason needs to submit to the Word of God. Now, if some things I've been given that are too high for me, I'll never be able to attain it. There's some things I've been given that God wants me to seek it out. He wants you to search. It says, now we have received the spirit who is from God that we might know the things that have been freely given us by God. But wisdom is to, it's the wisdom of kings to search out a matter. And that means that, that to search out what God is speaking and how is that applicable in my everyday life? How do I apply that truth into everyday life? And We've received it, and God's not trying to keep it a secret from us. He's hidden it for us. He actually wants you to search it out. It's not hidden from us. It's hidden for us. So there are many things that God really wants you to seek. He's looking for people who are passionately pursuing him, a relentless pursuit, not a casual walk in the park. I'm convinced that some people's minds are not operating in the light of revelation like they should simply because their consecration is very casual. And in some cases, if I was going to be real blunt, in some cases because they're a Christian, but Jesus really isn't Lord. He's really not first place. They've got a lot of other lovers that are basically as important, equal to Jesus. That tells me there's a major deficiency there in understanding. And they will struggle with understanding most of their Christian life. But the fact of the matter is, we have the mind of Christ. By the way, when we have the mind of Christ, this is the mind of Christ. 
my knower, not here. That keeps you humble. If you want the mind of Christ, you have to inquire God and then let it rise up. You don't tell God how to run things. You let God rise up into your life and affect you. So the enemy wants you to do the opposite of everything I'm saying, doesn't he? He wants you to reason. He wants you to figure it out. He wants you to get frustrated to know. God didn't say when you pursue him and you search him, you inquire and vital. It's a form of worship. It's a, it's a divine romance. It's not frustration searching. If you're frustrated searching, you're leaning too heavily on your understanding. Acknowledge him. Know him. Know him intimately down here and he will direct your path. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust is down here, not here. Trust in the Lord. Trusting, yielding, surrendering, and he will direct your path. As he directs your path, as you obey, John 7, 17, as you obey, you shall know. Oh, wait a minute, what is that? By Grace is the ability to obey. So when you obey the promptings of the Spirit, you take a baby step of obedience, all of a sudden then you shall know whether that was God or not. Oh my goodness, you can't figure it out in advance? I've watched people even when we do one-on-one -on -one ministry. There are some people that go like this. You're just like turning a key and boom, boom. They just allow God to minister. Choom, choom. Then there's others who are like this. That's a bad sign, by the way. If they go like this, that means they're figuring it out. And, and it's like they are locked into, and this is a fear, by the way. They're locked into a fear. I have to understand before I do it. Do you realize how you're limiting your future, your identity, and the very presence of God? You don't have to understand before you do it. You obey God to the best of your ability, and then you shall know. Do his will, and you shall know if the teachings of Christ are not, if it's reality, spiritual reality. By the way, God knows everything. We not only have the mind of Christ, but God knows everything. If you say, surely darkness shall fall on me, in Psalm 139, verses 11, even the night shall be light about me. I like that. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as a day and the darkness as the light, and they're both alike to God. All right? He doesn't have a problem with the darkness. He is light. And Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, thoughts and plans of welfare, peace, not for evil, and, the, and to give you hope, and to give you a final outcome. How many times have you heard, the, God's word is a lamp unto my feet. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. If your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Therefore the light that is in you is darkness. How great is your darkness? That means some of the most brilliant people on planet Earth, if they're not a believer, quite frankly, they're walking in darkness and the futility of their mind, no matter how brilliant they are, no matter what life accomplishments they are, they're, they're walking in darkness whether they know it or not. And if you're a believer and that darkness in you is, how, how can a believer have darkness in the mind? Darkness in the mind could be double-minded, but who... who who darkens the mind anyway? Isn't it the God of this world that blinds the mind of the unbelievers? Well, the God of this world would like to still blind your mind. In any place, here's the solution, by the way. Better get to the solution real quick here on the mind. Uh, it's that, that basically if it's light versus dark, we need to understand that, the, that it's God's revelation that enlightens my eye. It's the illumination from the Spirit. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, but light has come into the world, but what? What happened when light came into the world? But people preferred darkness, why? Because their deeds were evil. So if you have evil deeds, don't expect revelation. I've seen more people in, a, in times of turmoil and sinful behavior try to tell me what God's telling them. I always go, yikes. <laughs> if you're in the midst of sin and you're hearing from God, I, my first question is, mm, uh, which one? All right? Because, you know, if he's not telling you to repent and cleanse yourself from the sin, I don't trust their guidance any more than the man in the moon. But they will say, God said. But the most perfect, perfect way 
is to either ignore what the Word of God says or hate your brother. So if you have a mind problem and fear starts to rule, there's one way to stay in the light. To walk in the light as he is in the light, you have fellowship with him and with one another. So the, the two primary enemies for the mind would be the accuser of the brethren, unresolved judgment against other people. That will cloud your thinking and it will lean you to reason on why that is the case. And you, you, you can build a case for anything. Uh, but the, the primary way is you are ignoring the word. What did it say? Light came into the world, but people loved the darkness because their deeds were evil. If you are practicing and you are in the place of compromise, in that compromise you're ignoring the word, there's a certain element of darkness over the mind at any given time. And those are always the people, as a pastor in the church, that was always uh, something that it was like, what do I do? There's not much I can do there. They're telling me they heard from God. They're in the midst of sin, but they heard from God. And I don't trust it any more than the, than the man in the moon should trust it. And that's slang, by the way. The man in the moon, you can just eliminate that part. <laughs> the confidence has to be that when the heart is right, the mind has a defense. And when the heart's right, the defense of the mind is revelation knowledge. Your mind was made for illumination, for revelation knowledge. As a matter of fact, when Jesus is Lord, revelation rules the mind. The thoughts of God rules the mind. And it becomes as natural as breathing and you walk in the light as he is in the light. You're walking in your identity mentally. Mental identity is basically that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights and you to walk in the light, not in darkness, but you're to walk as children of light. The only true illumination of the mind does not come through much study. That was my Harvard uh, disciple, one of the most brilliant people I've ever worked with, and I got the privilege of being able to mentor him in the first five years of his Christianity. And it was such a treat. But he says, the education of the mind comes through much study, but the education of the heart comes only by the anointing of God. And he really only, he really only longed for that illumination that came from the Spirit, not that came from education in any form. He was more impressed with how God could inspire and give life to even to his thought life. And he saw that it was so profoundly superior for his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. And discovering that is, is probably one of the greatest delights in life for even a highly intellectual person. Discovering that God is smarter than you. That God knows things you'll never know. And that God wants to reveal himself to you. He gave you a spirit and a capacity to have the mind of Christ and to search out the matters. That it actually he's not hiding from you. He's hiding what? For you. He wants you to pursue him. He wants the relationship. And the fear of the unknowable falls by the wayside. Jennifer doesn't fear what, what you don't know at all. But there was a time when it trumped a lot of her thinking. But what if? What if, could have, should have? Da, da, da. You could stay there forever in your life. But if you walk in the light, plus she chose the solution to the renewed mind, and that was to walk in a forgiveness lifestyle. Because if you have ought against brother, you let darkness back in. Walk in the light as he is in the light, and you have fellowship one with another. So the primary strategy for the mind is a forgiveness lifestyle. You can't lose, because then, regardless of people's behavior or your circumstances, you're walking in the light as he is in the light. You will have sufficient information. He will be your sufficiency, because you're a child of light. You're not going to walk in darkness. You're not going to stumble, and you're not, even if you've made bad decisions in the past, God is smart enough to get you back on the right track, and fix it. He's a God of restoration. 
he can restore in greater quality and quantity in, in the process. All right? So um, God's revelation is like supernatural headlights. <laughs> Think of it this way. God's revelation is like supernatural headlights. It's like you, know, you, you read something in the scripture and it's got life to it. When it goes up to the mind, the first thing you, ah, right? Sometimes it's, oh, first. <laughs> first, because it what? It separates flesh from spirit. So when you, when you get a revelation from the scripture, there's, first of all, sometimes there's a little, oh, I'm doing it wrong. Ah, you know, either way, but the, you want the ah, so that, that that revelation inspires you and motivates you. You walk in the light as he's in the light. So we want that. It says uh, in, in Micah 7, 8, the, the prophet basically uh, was making a declaration. He's telling, hey, enemy, don't rejoice over me, enemy, because when I fall, I'm getting back up. And when I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. When I don't know what's going on, when everything looks like it's falling on, I am going to yield to God and God, even in my darkness, in my unknowing, I am God confident. That's what you want. In your darkness, in the unknown, instead of fearing the unknown, you need to decree and declare that God will be a light to me. It's almost exciting that I don't know. I wonder how God's going to work this mess out. Everything's falling apart. Yikes. I wonder how my God is going to work this out because I'm a child of light. I'm not holding unforgiveness toward anybody. Therefore, I'm a child of light and my Father is the Father of lights and every good and perfect gift comes down from Him. Somehow He's working all things together for the good. Somehow in this mystery of my unknown. I am not fearful of the unknown. I actually rejoice in the unknown, knowing that even in this darkness, God is going to be a light to me, and he's going to direct my path. Can make it an exciting adventure and a journey instead of a woe is me. The sky's falling, right, Jennifer? Right. The sky never fell either. It's still there. Now, I'm so proud of her in less than 60 days. Those of you that are taking the 60-day challenge, some are actually starting to finish up within, this is day 59 for some of the early people uh, of the 60 days and getting good reports on the life change. Uh, others have just started the 60-day challenge, and I recommend, I don't even have to recommend it. They will do it on their own. You'd be surprised how many people said, I'm going to do it again. We saw young marriages put together saying, I'm going to do it again. I'll tell you why. Why? Is because God began to infuse their life with a God confidence. He began to renew their minds, their mindset. And light has come into their darkness. And I'll tell you, once, once you, you see with his eyes, you can't help but be attracted to his heart more fully, more completely. You get his eyes, you got his heart. You have his heart, you get his eyes. All right? But when in darkness or in sin or or even ignorance, God will be a light to me. He'll be a light. When I draw near to God, he will, he, God himself will bring me forth. He will bring me forth to the light, and I will see his righteousness. You know, I once was in darkness, but now I'm in the light. Therefore, I'm to walk as a child of light. Because every good and perfect gift comes from where? It comes from above, from the Father of lights. Something that, uh, that when God was dealing with this in my life as a young Christian, he used uh, the Goshen. How many are familiar with the story of Egypt and Goshen? What was the difference? There was fear all through Egypt, but there was light in Goshen. And God basically began to show me that in Exodus 10 when it says, the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven that there might be darkness over the land of Egypt. Darkness that can be felt. That darkness that could be felt is fear. It's fear-based. When they felt the darkness, it didn't feel good. Do you believe that? Darkness does not feel good. It's coming from the enemy's kingdom. And even though uh, uh, Lucifer, Satan in the wilderness, tempting Christ, don't tell me, he tried to use the scripture, but don't tell me that there wasn't fear on that scripture. It was coming from the only nature that he has, and that is fear. He doesn't understand the love of God. He only understands his own nature. He, 
He lives according to that nature. His words have that nature on it. And so it says that in Egypt, darkness which could be felt. And that's really the way I learn that fear, if it's attached to a thought, the fear has to be dealt with. I need to go to the light. I need to go to the Christ within. And I found that when I would go to the Christ within and receive forgiveness, this is so simple, you should do this the rest of your Christian life. I receive forgiveness for taking fear in something that God never gave me, not to mention that it's working against my identity. I receive forgiveness for taking that fear in. And as soon as I got peace, the light of what God wanted to reveal would come true because the light came out of who I am. I am a child of light. And suddenly your perspective changes. The thought process changed when you dealt with the source. The source changes when you yield to it. You come back. Actually, you could say you come back into your identity as a child of light. Walk in the light, and if you hold unforgiveness toward anybody, you better deal with that. Receive forgiveness for the unforgiveness toward another person because he that walks in the light has fellowship with God and with one another. And the blood of Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So that's the solution, to overcome the fear of the unknown, even a fear that can be felt, is that we need to learn how to dwell in Goshen. And how do we dwell in Goshen? We inquire and require his thoughts. I want those supernatural headlights. The enemy tries to blind the mind of the unbeliever, as well as believers, with hating your brother. If you can say, I don't live there, though. I, won't, I refuse to walk in anything other than a forgiveness lifestyle. Then God's headlights will be shining on your, your, your mind, and you will have clarity of thought. As a matter of fact, as a baby Christian, without any Christianese, I didn't have a language for it, but my, the first word that I realized that when I let Jesus rule on the inside of me was clarity. That was my word. I had no other word to explain a supernatural transformation. All I knew is I had clarity. I, all of a sudden, it was almost like you got total concept. Well, this is why we weren't, this is the way we were meant to live. This is, this is the purpose. This is, this is my real identity. This was the way I am supposed to live and view life. This is my world view. And that is light shining on that brain instead of trying so hard to figure things out. I even had to get a healing on this in the early years. I don't know if I ever shared this one for Jennifer. You can stick this in the current book if you want. But, but I had a teacher that, that was upset with me because I was an A student in her class, yet she would see me sitting at the desk going like, making all this shuffling my feet and she's going, this kid's making me a nervous wreck. Look at him. What, what is he doing in his seat? He's shuffling. That was when I couldn't get an answer. And she even called my mother and said, uh, are there problems at home? Uh, he's doing well, but these antics in the classroom He's not saying nothing out loud, but he's fidgeting like an, there was something, there was the fear that I didn't know or that I was going to make a mistake and do it wrong. And I'll tell you what, the enemy, I know even when the enemy came in. So I just, so later after I got saved, I don't know what my mom did with my mom. She probably told me, quit fidgeting. You know? <laughs> but later when I got saved, one of my healings was that when I was, uh, Changing into puberty, I think it was, which for me was very early, I don't know, 11, 12. And, and I woke up one night in the middle of the night with a bad dream. And I started talking real fast. I don't know what's happening, but I had this dream. And, I got, and it scared my mom and dad to such a degree, I don't know why, that they didn't tell me. But they made an appointment with a doctor and I went, and they didn't tell me why they were taking me to the doctor. And they started wiring electrodes, an EEG back then. They put little grease on their hair and little wires on your brain. And I'm going, they think I'm crazy. Well, that thought in and of itself could make you crazy. They think I'm crazy. And the fear was horrendous. And I sucked it in. 
And when I sucked it in, all I know is that the doctor came in or, the, or, or whoever was working and they said, count backward from 100. And I started to perspire because if I make a mistake counting, they're gonna lock me in a rubber room, I know it. That's how bad the fear was. I was perspiring, counting backwards from 100. What if I go 99, 98, 94, <laughs> you know? <laughs> ah. Something's wrong with him. The brain's not working. We're going to lock him up. Who knows what a fourth grader, fifth grader thinks like. But it was frightening to me. But when, but that, when I released that, I saw that fidgety of having to know, can't make a mistake. All of that was induced by a spirit of fear. Guess what? In this world, you got to make mistakes. And guess what? God can turn it into a beautiful rose garden if you let him. He can take those mistakes and build something beautiful out of it if you give it to God, if you surrender it and make yourself uh, under his lordship, okay? So uh, God basically basically dealt with that agitation that I, that I had to know and that I couldn't make a mistake. And he basically, uh, it brings peace to the mind to where your confidence is in God, not in having the right answers. Any of you still struggle with having the right answers? It's probably something that needs to go. You've got the right answer and he's living on the inside of you and all you have to do is be the best person that you can be. Walk in the identity of what God made you and you will fulfill your destiny. And knowing him is the most important thing. It's not what you know, it's who you know. The second battlefront. The will. In 1 Timothy 1.8, there's a battle and fear of the uncontrollable. If the mind was the fear of the unknowable, then the battle for overcoming your will is going to be the fear of the uncontrollable. And there are laws and controls and the reason there are even laws in society and controls, they're for your protection. The scripture says in 1 Timothy, the law is good when used lawfully. The law is a good thing when it's properly used. And I like this uh, in, in the New King James, it says, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, and that is for the purpose for which it was designed. But in the message it says, it's obvious, isn't it? that the law code isn't primarily for people who live responsibly, but for the irresponsible, who defy all authority, ride roughshod over God, life, sex, truth, whatever. They are contemptuous of this great message, that I've been put in charge of this great message. We've all been put in charge of a great message. And basically, the law is there. It's a form of love to protect the innocent from the lawless. But in reality, responsible people don't need to worry about control or about law, right? They abide by the law. Somebody's always afraid of, uh, of, of um, somebody uh, checking you out. Well, maybe you shouldn't be hiding something, you know? <laughs> don't. I like my space and my privacy, but at the same time, obey. Obey the law. So... Here's the key. If fear faces your choices, the law of God should convince us that we need him and release our control to him. The law is made for the insubordinate. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be called insubordinate. If I'm going to be attacked by fear and the enemy's kingdom, he's going to try to get me to make choices out of fear. And fear will either immobilize you to where you freeze or it'll make you do the wrong thing at the wrong time. Hurry up and do something. Fear will motivate. Fear will incapacitate. But nonetheless, fear is expressed within a law. So here's the, the thing that the Lord showed me. When I says, okay, God, you showed me how to win the battle for the mind and how not to let fear rule there. Well, how about fear and my will? 
all right? Because I've watched people. Do you ever see somebody at an intersection? The fearful person is the most dangerous one. They're waiting at a four-way stop, and maybe I should go, maybe I shouldn't go, maybe I should go. They'd be safe for just going and let people say, oh, they're going, I'll let them go, all right? But that, that hesitancy is fear-based, and you actually set yourself up to be an accident going somewhere to happen. Fear is not to be the motivator. The love of God is the motivator. You'll be in the right place at the right time all the time. So here's freedom. True biblical freedom is expressed within a law. Romans 8, 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So if the mind's battle for fear is light versus darkness, the will's battle is life versus death. There's two principles here, two laws, two spiritual uh, uh, things that, are, that we need to be aware of. Fear-based is the law of sin and death. Romans 8.2 says, but the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets you free from the law of sin and death. So real freedom for the will, there's hope for your will, by the way. Even if you're a very willful person, or even if you are a person who's been incapacitated and refuses to make choices, and you just lie down and be a doormat. The will is energized by the Spirit of God to the degree that you submit the will to Him. What have we taught you in all the modules? Yield the will so that God will do and perform. If you really want to find freedom, you find freedom for the will within a law. And there's only two laws. The law of the spirit of life and the law of sin and death. You choose. But it, when you yield to peace, you are no longer making choices out of fear. Never make a decision that's fear-based. Always from the place of peace under the rule of God. Control is the issue. Control is the problem in the will. A controlling person will either abdicate or, or move ahead presumptuously. But God, will, when you yield to the will, you're in the law of life. And you've, you're free from, in other words, to get free from a lower law, you must submit to a higher law. There's no free will that's unaffected by everything. Your will to be freed from the law of sin and death has to submit to a higher law. The higher law is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that set you free from the law of sin and death. So when you yield your will to God, it might feel like nothing, but in reality, you just submitted, you know, God, I want your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Your ways are higher. You just submitted to his ways, which are higher than your ways and superior in their outworking or their performance. I see in the church, uh, particularly with new believers, uh, I see a lot of hype that they call that the anointing. Uh, quite frankly, I hate to disappoint some of them, but you're not that anointed. <laughs> you haven't had enough life. You haven't had enough resistance to overcome the works of the flesh. A lot of that is hype, and a lot of that you're going to get tired doing eventually. Looks good, but basically part of the process that needs to be changed is a yielded will to where you let God work through you to will and to perform, to where you're not worn out from so-called ministry. That will, when given to God, and you submit to a higher law, becomes a guardrail. And that guardrail is a limitation, but it's a limitation for your safety. It's like a railing around a balcony. It's for your safety. It's not trying to limit you so you can't go farther. It's actually trying to keep you from getting hurt. In, uh, in Africa, th there was a childish concept of freedom. They call it Uhuru in Swahili, Uhuru. When Uhuru come, we can ride the bus and not pay. When Uhuru come, we can drive on whatever side of the street we want to. When Uhuru come, we can do whatever we want. That's just lawlessness. That's not freedom. Freedom is within a law. And the carnal mind is at enmity with, against God, for it's not subject to the law of God. 
You give authority to the law you obey. And if anyone wants to do or obey his will, he shall know. Isn't that interesting? The will and the mind work cooperatively in submission to God. So the solution for the, for the, for the will is simple. And we've shared this a number of times. For you to fulfill your destiny, the spirit's solution to the will is yield. When you yield the will, you win every time. So fear will get you to act or react. Yielding will get you to respond. Not only respond, but respond redemptively. So if there's areas of your life where you're still reacting, there's an area of the will that has not been surrendered to God. And you might need to find out what the root is. Wherever there's an impulsiveness or wherever you check out, that's a will problem. You know what I mean by check out? It means responsibility. You don't want to do it. You just go la la land somewhere. You go somewhere in your head. People that check out are basically irresponsible. They don't want to face the problem, so they just watch TV or something. They escape. And those are the two strategies. But if you would yield your will, you'll be right in the right place at the right time. And just like Jesus, when they went to push him off a hill, he submitted to the lordship of his father and walked right through the midst of them. Nobody can control someone who's under control. You cannot be controlled by any other person if Jesus is ruling. If Jesus is ruling, you are under control. You can't control someone who's under control. And the good news is, you will fulfill your destiny. For it is God who wills to perform according to his will through you. The last area, fear and the emotions. The problem is, in the emotional area, the attack on the emotions, when fear attacks you to where you feel it, all right, it's basically... coming from the natural fears that were in the world. Remember when you were separated from God, you were alienated, you walked in the futility of the mind, you lived basically in fear, even if you said, I'm not a fearful person. An unsaved person is still ruled by fear. Fear to get ahead, fear to get, but they wouldn't call it fear, they would just call it wisdom. <laughs> They would, just, they would just say, well, wisdom says I've got to look out for me. Wisdom says I've got to do this. Wisdom says, but it's fear. Uh, rich people are afraid somebody's going to take it, and the poor people are trying to get it. Okay, fear they don't have enough, and the rich people are afraid they're going to lose it. Fear is fear is fear. It doesn't make much difference, does it? It's the wrong kingdom. But in, in, in the world, a child says, my daddy can do anything when he's real little. And then when maturity comes, that confidence decreases. It's kind of sad, but it decreases with maturity. In the kingdom, kingdom truth is just the opposite. As we grow in the understanding of God's love for us and the power that's available, we become increasingly dependent on God. That was a hard one for me because raised in the city, the more independent you were from your parents, th that meant the more grown up you were. So even at eight or nine, you wanted to make this uh, distinction between me and dad doesn't have to drive me, I can walk. I can ride my bike, nobody has to drive me here, I can do this by myself. That maturity was independence, but in the kingdom of God, it's the exact opposite, and that's hard for a lot of people that maturity in the kingdom is basically emotionally, I've got daddy and my love relationship, I am more dependent on that love and that divine nature than I was a year ago. I am more dependent, not less dependent. And to the degree that I am more dependent, I become to the place where I realize that maturity is growing progressively in the revelation. This is a progressive revelation 
that apart from him I can do nothing. That it's the love nature that motivates me in the kingdom as a son. And that I am the vine, he is the vine, we are the branches rather. And without me you can do nothing, says God. So Jesus modeled the principle of dependence for us. I am in the Father, the Father in me. The words that I speak, I don't speak on my own authority. The Father in me who dwells in me, he does the works. In other words, Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, being the Son of God, yielded to the will of the Father on the inside of him. He was dependent. I don't say unless my Father. I don't do unless my Father. I don't unless my Father. He does the works. Isn't that interesting? It teaches dependence. He modeled dependence. And we're struggling in the world to be independent. So if we were going to get healed of this, I've got to put myself and personalize this. Here's the way I brought it back for me. I recognize that I was bought with the price that I'm not my own. But when I personalized it, God gave me Romans 14.4 in the Living Bible, and I had to change it and personalize it to me. Romans 14.4 says, they are God's servants, not yours. They belong to him, not to you. God is able to tell them whether they're right or wrong. God is able to make them do as they should. But here's what God had to do for me to personalize my dependence upon him in a deeper way so that fear would be eradicated. And this worked for Jennifer as well. This eradicated fear from her emotionally. She basically entered into her true identity as a believer and said, I am God's servant, not mine. (laughs) I am responsible to him, not to me. Let him tell me whether I am right or wrong, for God is able to make me do as I should. I put myself literally in God's hands to such a degree that my identity was based on him expressing himself through me rather than me trying to find out who I was. I've watched people in the church trying to find out who they were. They took all the uh, who I am in Christ. And the problem with that was that in a lot of places, the emphasis was still too much on who I am rather than in Christ. And uh, uh, one of Jennifer's uh, alumni from Florida State, a sociologist, just wrote an article recently that says, we have wasted, this is secular now, we have wasted the generations telling them to get self-esteem. We have come to this radical conclusion This is a recent discovery for them. Of course, they're unsaved people. We have come to this radical conclusion that self-esteem has never produced anything except an entitlement mentality. Self-esteem has not produced anything of value. Now they're saying what we should have done is taught them to perform and accomplish something and be glad they accomplished something instead of telling them how wonderful and entitled they are without ever doing anything. Self-esteem is a joke. You do not need self-esteem. You esteem God and who you are in him and allowing him to live his life through you and you have the identity problem solved. Isn't that something the secularists realized that all of this brainwashing on self-esteem has not produced anything. There, can be, there is no evidence that convincing a child their whole life to have self-esteem has ever produced anything of value. You don't need to esteem self. You need to bring self to the cross. Honor God. Recognize that I'm going to put myself in God's hands. That means me. <laughs> let's pray this through let's pray this through one I recognize that I was bought with the price two I'm personalizing this that I'm God's servant not mine I'm a derivative life I didn't make me God made me and I'm going to put myself in God's hands Some of us ought to do what David did when he was in great distress. 
Let me fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercies are great. Do not let me fall into the hands of man, <laughs> including my own. Let me fall into the hands of God. That self-rule has become a curse. And God's basically saying, I fear failure. I feared rejection. I feared punishment. I feared incompetence. All of those things are devil faith. They're all coming from the enemy. They're all coming from the wrong kingdom. And I renounce and receive forgiveness for taking fear into my mind, into my will, and into my emotions in any way, shape, or form. I want to be motivated by the love of God. I want my emotions to flow with the love and the fruit of the Spirit. I want my will to be ruled by the law of life in Christ Jesus. For it's God who is at work both to will and to perform. And my mind, the screen of my mind is made for revelation, for inspiration, for clarity, and for light. I'm a child of light. That is who I really am. I receive forgiveness, and from this day forward, if I even feel fear, even in a minor anxiety, I'm going to receive forgiveness for taking it in if I take it in, but I'm going to learn to resist more effectively the enemy of my soul. The enemy of my soul in that kingdom is fear, and I'm going to more thoroughly resist taking it in in the first place. God didn't give it to me, I'm not taking it in. God didn't give me a spirit of fear, I'm not taking a spirit of fear in. Fear belongs to the world, even to the best of them, even to the most gifted and accomplished. Fear belongs to them. It doesn't belong to a child of light. There's no place in me for fear. Perfect love casts out fear. And that maturing love is maturing day to day. And I'm going to learn how to resist the reasoning mind. I'm going to learn how to enter into the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus by allowing God's will, by surrendering and by yielding. And my emotions belong to God. And fear has no place in them. God didn't give it to me. I'm not taking it. I receive forgiveness for taking in any of these things. And I am going to face the enemy of my soul, mind, will, and emotions in the days ahead more fully and more completely. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I am I'm going to submit to God and resist the devil more fully and more completely. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.